The topic is acute gingival infections. Now, what are these acute gingival infections? We know that most of the times, the ginger, gingival infections or gingival diseases or, gingiva, or the inflammation of the gingiva is usually, usually chronic. But then there are certain conditions which occur at a very acute stage. Now, these acute gingival infections will be covered in this topic today. What are the three important acute gingival infections that can occur and result in a kind of a infection at a very acute condition or these are uh, which, which can even cause a kind of systemic burden on the host. Now, these include your necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, your primary herpetic gingival stomatitis and your pericolonitis. Let's talk in detail about each one of the lesions. First comes your necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. Now this necrotizing as the term indicates it's necrosis and there is an ulceration and this is involving your gingiva. Now probably in these patients might have a pre-existing gingivitis and that can be a contributing factor involved with a host uh, compromised immune response. So now this can be additional factor in causing these kind of diseases. Now this necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis is basically a microbial disease of the gingiva in an impaired host response. Okay, it's characterized basically by the death and sloughing of your gingival tissue with an impaired host response and it presents with certain characteristic signs and symptoms. Let's look in detail uh, a little bit about what are the characteristic signs and symptoms a little later. But before that, uh, we know that it is an acute disease. The first clinical feature, definitely it's an acute disease. So your gingiva will be more erythematous, right? Because it's uh, once your uh, this kind of an infection is treated, it enters your subacute stage. If it is uh, not left treated, then probably th if the host immune response increases, then it might resolve and lead into a subacute stage. It, the patients might have a history of repeated remissions and exacerbations, or it can even recur in a previously treated patient. Th again, that depends on the immunity of the host and the other predisposing factors. Now, the involvement of your acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, it can either involve a single tooth or it can involve multiple teeth or it can entirely, it can spread to the entire mouth. Now, when your anug or your necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis spreads to involve your periodontal apparatus, you would call it as your necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis. Now, this specially occurs in a long-standing case of anug. If the patient is having this uh, necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis for a very long period of time. As I told, if it is left untreated, it might enter your subacute stage. So, in those kind of patients, there is a chronic kind of a uh, stimulus which is left behind, right? So, this can enter what is called as your necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis. And then, even your severe immunocompromised states. Now, the patient will usually give you a history of uh, symptoms which are sudden in onset. Sometimes following an episode of debilitating disease or an acute respiratory tract infections. Now they, th probably he will also give you a history of changing of his living habits and his uh, probably his poor nutritional status, psychological stress and tobacco use. And protracted work and inadequate rest can also be your other uh, characteristic history that the patient will come with. What are the oral symptoms? Now we know the patient will come with a chief complaint sometimes with he will tell you that you know when you just drag the history of the patient or when you take the history of the patient the patient will reveal that you know he's been he's been undergoing a lot of stress he's having a lot of work okay he's not having a proper kind of sleep so what are the oral symptoms the lesions are especially very sensitive to touch they're very painful because it's kind of ulcerated and it is necrosed. Apart from that, the patient will complain of a constant radiating gnawing type of pain and then he is very sensitive. His tissues are very sensitive to your eating anything spicy, hot or even while chewing. Any hot or eating spicy food can aggravate the condition or it can uh, cause the patient a lot of pain or soreness kind of a feeling and then even your chewing can aggravate the pain. Apart from that, the patient will have, uh, will complain of a metallic taste, okay, and then a pasty kind of saliva. What are the extraoral signs and symptoms? 
and uh, systemic signs and symptoms together the patient definitely it's an acute necrotizing it's it's it, it's a disease it's an infection which can cause some systemic complications like your localized lymphadenopathy it can cause fever it can cause an increased pulse rate leukocytosis loss of appetite and then probably the patient can also have some insomnia be the lack of sleep because of the pain and then constipation any other gi disorders headache etc mental depression mental depression okay now let's see what are the oral signs now we've discussed the oral symptoms that is your pain and then the patient has foul taste or pasty saliva metallic taste and then he has uh, uh, he has difficulty or the pain increases with the kind of eating food habits and then eating spicy food or while chewing so what are the signs of or what are the oral signs now if you look at the oral signs you find some typical features that is your punched out lesions or punched out crater like depressions especially starting at the tip of your interdental papilla now from the tip of the interdental papilla the lesion can spread to involve your marginal gingiva and sometimes can involve your attached gingiva now how is the surface when you, when you clinically examine how is the surface of these punched out craters now this punched out craters are usually covered by gray pseudo membrane and around the pseudo membrane the entire gingival margin would be erythematous so there is a erythematous halo just around your gray pseudo membrane okay and then you can the you can remove once you remove try to eliminate the pseudo membrane or by, once you try to wipe it off what you have what you see is hemorrhagic areas right underneath your pseudo membrane and then if this gingival condition or the infection spreads to involve your apparatus your periodontal then it will cause lesions even in your uh, periodontal uh, tissue the other uh, periodontal uh, supporting tissues that is there will be resorption of alveolar bone the gingival margin can get recessed okay because entire tissue is getting necrosed and then there is spontaneous bleeding on probing you don't even have to provoke the bleeding by using a, a probe it will just start bleeding okay they have a pronounced bleeding with the slightest even after slightest stimulation there's a fetid odor and increased salivation and this the consistency of the saliva would be more increased or increased in viscosity how's the clinical course of the disease i told you that if the disease is severe in uh, nature then it can have the capacity to spread to your underlying periodontal structures and then involve or turn to become your necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis apart from that you can have or the patient can develop severe systemic complications now pinborg has classified various stages of involvement of your necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis he said first it starts with the erosion of the tip of the papilla and then it will go to involve the entire papilla and then of your marginal gingiva and slowly it will go to involve your attached gingiva and one final day if it is not treated it can lead to even exposure of your bone because the entire tissue is getting necrosed so please understand it is not just inflammation that it will resolve it is necro process of the tissue that is happening there so the entire tissue is gone which will lead to with the, towards the final stage can lead to exposure of the bone and there's one more uh, uh, classification or one more uh, it was horning and cohen who again described different stages of this anak now they said that your anak can be different or you can you know the spread of this disease can be into seven stages or you can limit it into seven stages the first stage that he said is just that the there be just necrosis of your tip of interdental papilla stage 2 he said if the infection spreads then it will go to involve the entire papilla and then stage 3 it will involve your marginal gingiva stage 4 will the necrosis will extend to your attached gingiva stage 5 it necrosis will extend to your buccal and the lingual or the labial mucosa and then stage 6 it will lead to exposure exposure of your alveolar bone and necrosis extending to your alveolar bone leading to the exposure of the underlying bone and then stage 7 the necrosis can spread even to your skin it can literally perforate the skin of the cheek and it can turn out to become noma or necrotizing stomatitis now let's see now we finish the clinical course of the disease depending on the various stages we we we've, we've known what are the clinical um, signs and symptoms oral signs and symptoms systemic signs extra oral signs now let's see what is histopathology what what do you see when you take a section of this 
piece of uh, uh, tissue under uh, microscope what do you see the first thing that you see is there is a kind of an inflammatory process that's happening in the gingival margin now this you, we know that the gingiva has an epithelium and it has a connective tissue. The epithelium is usually stratified squamous epithelium and then you have your connective tissue. Now if you see because of the necrosis the entire surface epithelium is destroyed and it is filled with just fibrin some necrotic epithelial cells followed by layer of polymorphonuclear leukocytes and then various microorganisms. Let's see what are the microorganisms. A little later. Most of the times the microorganisms that are involved are the fusospirochetal form of microorganisms. Now this uh, zone, now what we've described, right, the surface epithelium, in the previous slide we described that the surface epithelium is destroyed and it is basically, it is filled with fibrin and below that you, you can find some necrotic epithelial cells and then you can find some polymorphonuclear neutrophils and then various microorganisms. Now this entire area is what is called as your pseudomembrane. So you're basically what you what appears as a pseudomembrane clinically is what the previous slide showed that these are the histologic features of this pseudomembrane that is seen clinically. What happens in the connective tissue? Your connective tissue is rapidly, you have your vascular proliferation engorged blood vessels and then you have close infiltration of your neutrophils. Now, these engorged blood vessels can be a reason for your uh, increase in the hemorrhage or the appearance of the hemorrhagic spots immediately you remove your pseudomembrane. Then what are the bacteria that you see? You have various bacteria that you have uh, noticed but the most important ones are the fusospirochetes and the, uh, of the spirochetes uh, group the majority of the one that is your treponema microdentium. Apart from the fusiform bacteria you also find other cocci and bacilli and then spirochetes. Etiology. Now, what is the etiology for this disease? The etiology is you can't just simply blame it on the microbiota. So, the, the, the etiology is first is the role of bacteria. Now, the role of bacteria is mainly because of the fusiform bacillus and this uh, fusiform bacteria and your spirochetes. I told you of the spirochetes, the major one is your treponema microdentium and then role of host response. Now you know uh, a patient with a decreased host response always is prone for a kind of an infection. A similar thing happens here. Now if the patient if the patient's uh, body or the host uh, or the uh, immune, immune response of the host is not able to combat the microbiotal infection then he will uh, it will result in a fusospirochetal abscess. Okay. There will be extension and then it may be associated with physical and emotional stress. What are the local predisposing factors? The local predisposing factors can include already a pre-existing gingivitis, an injury to the gingiva, maybe because of some trauma or smoking. Okay, Your deep periodontal pockets and your pericoronal flaps can act as a good source or good area for this necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis to develop because your fusobacterial uh, your bacterial species can have a good ecological nike in your deep periodontal pockets and your pericoronal flaps. Which is the other etiological factor? Apart from your predisposing factors, you have your systemic predisposing factors. The systemic predisposing factors can include your immunodeficiency, the nutritional state status, and the, or the nutritional deficiencies, then uh, fatigue caused by sleep, a chronic sleep deficiency, Habits like alcohol or drug abuse and then your systemic diseases like your diabetes. Again, the diabetes also has an effect on the immune response, right? Diabetes and debilitating infections. And other causes like your psychosomatic factors like anxiety, then stress, depression and any other psychiatric uh, deviances. Okay, that finishes your acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. Now, we will cover the treatment a little later. Let's see the other condition that is your primary herpetic gingival stomatitis. Now your primary herpetic gingival stomatitis is mainly caused by your herpes virus. And this herpes virus it can be of two forms. You have your HSV1 and HSV2. The one which causes the oral lesions are your HSV1 or the herpes simplex virus 1, type 1. Okay, And the HSV type 2 is more limited to your genital lesions. Now this primary herpetic gingival stomatitis can occur or it is most of the time seen in children less than six years of age but it has also been reported in elderly individuals.
Now, it, it, it doesn't have any predilection for males or females. It occurs equally in both the genders. And then, in most of the per persons, the primary infection can go asymptomatic. And what happens once the patient develops uh, this primary herpetic gingival stomatitis? Uh, this is the first time that the patient has incorporated or he has caught the disease. Now, over a period of time, what happens? This virus gets latent or, or it, it remains in the body, especially in your sensory neural ganglia, the HSV, neural, especially your trigeminal ganglia. And then later, uh, after some uh, stimulus, maybe a secondary stimulus like fever or any kind of a trauma, or exposure to uh, sunlight or stress and all these factors act as triggering factors to cause a secondary infection secondary herpetic infection so secondary herpetic stomatitis can result or occur as a part of even dental treatment two or four days later what are the basically maybe maybe related to stress okay what are the clinical features of the disease the oral signs most of the times or the oral signs Again, the gingiva will be extremely erythematous. In, before the erythematous areas can start, you have vesicle formation. There are small vesicle formations and these vesicle formations slowly rupture and then you get an ulcer. Now, these ulcers can coalesce together and form a big ulcer. See, the vesicles rupture within 24 hours and then you can... Once the vesicles rupture, you have some painful ulcers. Now, these ulcers again will have a border of a uh, erythematous uh, halo border of your uh, uh, involved area. The course of the disease is usually 7 to 10 days and it resolves by itself. You don't need any special treatment for these diseases. But then if it affects children, the children are usually extremely irritable because it's a very painful condition. What are the oral symptoms? Again, I said there will be a generalized soreness of the mouth. So, there will be difficulty in eating or drinking or if it is affecting. And there will be a lot of pain uh, because of the ulcer formation. And then the, the patients will be very much sensitive to thermal food, cold or any kind of a spicy food because of the painful ulcers. Systemic signs, definitely they'll have some fever because it's a systemic viral infection. It's cervical adenitis or lymphadenopathy and generalized malaise or weakness. When you take a histopathology, most of the times you'd find some typical features that is your zanc cells because of the epithelial or the ballooning degeneration of your epithelial cells. Now, there's a vesicle formation, there's an intraepithelial vesicle formation. Apart from that, there is acantholysis, there is nuclear clearing and even nuclear enlargement. How do you diagnose? Most of the times, primary herpetic gingival stomatitis goes with diagnosis of just with clinical features. Apart from that, uh, history and uh, your clinical features. Apart from that, you can also take a culture of your, uh, or take a section or the uh, culture of the fluid which is in the vesicles and then you can subject it to some immunological tests or you can isolate the virus. Differential diagnosis of your uh, primary herpetic gingival stomatitis include your erythema multiforme, Steven Johnson syndrome, bullous lichen planus, and then discomative gingivitis and recurrent after stomatitis. Now let's see the next condition that is your pericoronitis. Now your pericoronitis is another acute form of gingival infection. Now this basically in as the uh, term denotes it is inflammation of the pericoronal area so corona meaning the coronal portion of your tooth and the peri meaning the area around it so there is an inflammation of the tissue which is covering a partially erupted tooth and most of the times or major of the thing is towards your mandibular erupting third or second molars now this refers basically to the inflammation of the gingiva around the partially erupted tooth now, it occurs often in the mandibular third molar area. There is an acute inflammatory involvement which is exacerbated by trauma, occlusion or a foreign body trapped underneath the tissue flap. What are the clinical features? You know there is a kind of a space between the partially erupted tooth and the pericoronal flap so the, which is also called as your operculum. So now this spa space gets constantly filled with a lot of food debris and plaque and over a period of time it starts to infect this pericoronal flap and then it can also turn out to become your per pericoronal abscess. Now, apart from that, the patient will complain of a lot of pain and then when you see the uh, clinical features, the area looks erythematous and then it looks inflamed and slight provocation can cause bleeding. 
and then patient might have even trismus and inability to, to close the mouth if there is a kind of a peri uh, coronal abscess apart from the uh, thing yeah, the patient might also develop some kind of fever and uh, 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 lymphadenopathy the complications what are the complications of pericoronitis it can lead, as i told it can lead into forming an abscess or it can uh, cause involvement of your lymph nodes swelling of the cheek at the region of the uh, region of the third molar and then it can cause trismus the other complications it can or the potential sequelae include your peritonsular abscess or quincy or else it can even cause your cellulitis and ludwig's angina sometimes it can go to involve even your other deep cervical group of lymph nodes what is the treatment for anag the treatment for acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis is you can uh, classify these patients into non ambulatory patients and ambulatory patients non ambulatory patients are the ones which have who who have severe systemic complications and the ambulatory patients are the one which have mild uh, systemic uh, uh, symptoms now how do you treat on day 1 first thing that you should do is you should do a local treatment that is just limited to removal of the pseudo membrane probably you can just use small cotton swab and then which is dipped in hydrogen peroxide and try to remove this pseudo membrane and then advise good bed rest for the patients and then put him on copious fluid and take and then you can give him every 2 hours 3% hydrogen peroxide mouth rinses okay followed by systemic administration of antibiotics which is mainly penicillin or metronidazole can be prescribed if the patient is allergic to penicillin then you can give him erythromycin on day 2 if the condition is improved then you can do the same treatment that you're going to do for your ambulatory patient if the symptoms are not recover if the patient is not recovered from the symptoms then you have to repeat again the local debridement of the area with hydrogen peroxide and then keep him on the same uh, uh, 3% or hydrogen peroxide rinses and then continue your antibiotic treatment on day 3 if the patient condition is improved then you can shift him to the treatment of ambulatory patient now let's see what is the treatment that you have to do for an ambulatory for patient on the first visit when he comes to you and you have diagnosed it with the uh, uh, your acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis the first thing that you should do is avoid doing any kind of a uh, vigorous kind of a treatment what you need to do first is you have to remove this pseudo membrane and then you have to superficially remove the calculus with an ultrasonic scaler don't even take a hand instrument to try to do scaling and then whenever you're doing see the word superficial calculus removal you're not supposed to insert or you know go uh, sub gingivally in order to remove the calculus just superficially remove this calculus so that it will relieve him of a little bit of the local factors so that the inflammatory process also can come down and then the patients with moderate to severe necrotizing ulcerative and uh, who are also having lymphadenopathy can be put on some antibiotic regimens like penicillin 500 mg thrice daily if the patient is allergic to penicillin then you can put him on erythromycin and metronidazole 200 or 400 mg twice daily for about 7 days and then subgingival i told subgingival scaling and curatage are contraindicated on day 1 or the first visit now the instructions that you give the patient are you can tell him to rinse his mouth every 2 hours with 3% of hydrogen peroxide and then you should tell him to avoid smoking and alcohol and then confine the tooth brushing to the removal of just the surface debris with a bland dentifrice or and uh, use interdental aids and some chlorhexidine mouthwashes on the second visit you can include your scalers and your curettes to your armamentarium okay because there will be some kind of a shrinkage of the gingiva because you have already removed so on the second visit you can include your scalers and curettes to the armamentarium and then you can repeat the same instructions that you are giving the patient on the first visit on the third visit what do you do is again you repeat your scaling and root planing procedures you do good plaque control instructions are repeated and then you tell the patient to stop using the hydrogen peroxide on the third visit okay On the fourth visit, you again reinforce the oral hygiene instructions and then do a thorough scaling and root planing. And then on the fifth visit, you give the uh, patient a fixed treatment of uh, chronic gingivitis. Means by the fifth visit, the patient is already recovered. And then if any deep periodontal pockets or if you need to do any kind of a surgical procedure or you need to do curettage or any kind of thing, you can go ahead with the treatment at the fifth visit.
and then put the patient on a maintenance protocol. What are the further treatments that you should do for this patient? Now you have treated the patient off with acute gingival infection and the patient is left behind with those interdental craters, right? So what, what happens if, the, if, if you are left behind with those interdental cr cr craters? Now these areas are more prone for accumulation of plaque. They become non-maintainable. Therefore, you have to bring back to the normal health or you, you have to bring back to the normal contour of the gingiva. So for that, you have to consider doing a gingivoplasty procedure in these patients. Then systemic uh, antibiotics only in patients having toxic systemic complications. The supportive systemic treatment would be your copious fluid and good bed rest, analgesics and nutritional supplements like your BN, vitamin C supplements. What is the treatment for your pericoronitis? Your pericoronitis treatment, first what you have to do is to control the severity of inflammation. If it is a pericoronal abscess, then probably you have to drain the abscess. You can use, you, you can use your warm salt water uh, irrigation in order to remove or eliminate the, uh, the uh, debris or the kind of infection which is, which is um, involving your pericoronal area that would give you a good result. Okay. Apart from that, systemic complications can be handled by putting the patient on some antibiotics. And then once the, uh, once the uh, acute symptoms have resolved, then you can decide whether you want to save the tooth or whether you want to go for pericoronal uh, or operculectomy. Now, if you want to extract the tooth, it's better. If, if you feel that there's no enough space for the tooth to completely erupt, then it's better to go for in, uh, extraction after the acute symptoms have uh, resolved. If not, then probably you have to think of doing something called as a operculectomy. That is removal or excision of the pericoronal flap. That continues, that, uh, uh, that, that concludes your acute uh, gingival infections. Thank you.